Route 66 in Search of Ghosts and Treasures, Chapter 4, Oklahoma. This is Phyllis Chandler Gray, and I'm going to read parts of the book and narrate through the illustrations. Look to the far right. The Harrises will begin their journey in Oklahoma and then continue through Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Oklahoma. We stopped to read a monument on the roadside, entering Indian Territory. It told of the U.S. government giving over land in 1833 to 20 tribes, including the Ogapa, Seneca, Shawnee, Peoria, Miami, Ottawa, and Wyanda. A sign of commerce proclaimed that this was the birthplace of Mickey Mantle. He was one of the most famous baseball players ever, Lottie spoke excitedly. Grandpa had his baseball card. Our parents gave up looking for a vintage Route 66 motel in Miami area. The Hampton Inn desk clerk welcomed us to Miami. Mom remarked that near the bigger towns and cities, mom and pop motels from back in the day were vanishing like ghosts. We were settled in for the night until Dad suggested he take Lottie and I out to nearby Spook Light Road to see if we could spot the mysterious light of unknown origin, as the military called it. We arrived back at the motel in an hour. We did not have a spook-like sighting, but enjoyed Dad sharing the legends surrounding the light with a trailing tail. Our next breakfast was a family powwow. Our parents wanted us to understand the importance of Native Americans in the history of Route 66. Dad said that Oklahoma was the perfect place to visit several cultural centers and debunk the stereotyping of Indians that had been done through the early years of Route 66. In the 1830s, President Jackson had relocated tribes from many areas and placed them in Oklahoma, which was once called Indian Territory. Today, there are 39 tribes in Oklahoma. Mom talked about businesses naming themselves with Indian names and using signage and decor with Indian symbols. Some owners even hired Indians to be present in costume to lure tourists. What developed was a monolithic Indian that was a false representation. In reality, there were distinct cultures and histories for the people of the more than 25 tribal nations crossed by Route 66. Dad had a list of tribes and pueblos along the historic highway. He was carrying a printout from the American Indians and Route 66 project. We would learn about this. In Afton, Oklahoma, we saw many ghosted buildings and were sad that the Afton station, once full of beautiful Packard automobiles, had closed. North of the Afton station, we found a 10-mile stretch of Route 66, referred to as the Ribbon Road or Sidewalk Highway because it was only 9 feet wide. With limited money available, early builders realized they could make the highway longer if they narrowed it. 25 miles ahead at Vanita, we dined in a McDonald's that arched over the Will Rogers Turnpike. Inside sat a huge sculpture of Will Rogers, a favorite cowboy actor and humorist from Oklahoma. The small town of Foyle honored Andy Payne. This local farm boy with Cherokee heritage won the 1928 Bunyan Derby, created to promote the new Route 66. Andy ran 3,400 miles from Los Angeles to New York. He won $25,000, which he used to pay off his parents' farm. A second attraction in Foil was Ed Galloway's Totem Pole Park. Ed Galloway built a 90-foot totem pole from concrete, along with a number of other totems. He even trimmed his house in a matching manner. Mom noticed his designs were Native American-inspired folk art. Grandma had loved this place, according to her journal. Mom admitted after seeing this folk art that she was developing an appreciation for this folksy type of kitsch. I finally asked Mom to tell us what she meant by kitsch. She said it was hard to define, but you just know it when you see it. She went on to explain that it was the German word for thrown together. What he had thrown together was the largest totem pole in the world. Katusa was a favorite stop. How often do you see an 80-foot whale on a small lake, a place where kids used to swim? It was built by Hugh Davis, the curator of the Tulsa Zoo, as an anniversary present for his wife Zelda. It was kitsch but cool. Near Tulsa at Sepulpa, a 66-foot gas pump directed us to the heart of Route 66 Car Museum, 
one of the newest treasures on the road. The Rock Cafe at Stroud was our lunch stop. Dad said the rocks used to build the cafe were gathered while clearing the way to pave Route 66. At Chandler, we enjoyed driving some rolling hills of Route 66 and photographing the old cottage-style Phillips 66 service station. It was a rescued ghost. Tulsa's planning a new Route 66 experience, and we can hardly wait. We stopped at the relics of an old stone service station at Luther at the edge of the Rock of Ages farm. This Conoco station is one of the oldest relics on Route 66. The owner had been convinced by a salesman from Chicago during the Al Capone days to set up a hidden room behind the station and print $10 bills. The phony money was traced back to the station and the owner went to prison for forgery. Our next stop was the Round Barn at Arcadia. Rose asked why the building didn't have corners. Lottie had been told by the caretaker that it was built so that if the devil chased you, he couldn't corner you. We knew he was kidding. We stopped at the McJerry Gallery in Chandler to pick up the latest version of the Route 66 Guide for Travelers. Also, we looked at Jerry's paintings. Jerry McClanahan, cartographer and artist extraordinaire. Nearby was a new Route 66 treasure, Glass Boy Studios, where neon could be repaired and created. A special treat was a stop at Pop Soda Ranch. How could we decide with over 700 different sodas? We posed in front of the soda bottle outside and wished that we could see it at night when the neon made it look like the soda was being sipped through the straw. Back on the road, we had voted five out of five that Pops was the coolest new treasure and kids place on Route 66. At Quentin, we visited the Oklahoma Route 66 Museum. On the grounds was a restored Valentine Diner. These diners were prefabricated buildings that were shipped from a factory in Indiana. They could be delivered quickly and tailored to a new business owner's wishes. Dad said that these diners helped the boom of businesses after World War II. The museum tour led us through a time capsule. We moved from decade to decade through the displays. We especially liked the display on the Dust Bowl days, the Big Band era, and the 1940s and 1950s diner. Near Hydro, Dad told us about Lucille Hammonds, who had run the service station in cabins from 1941 until her death in 2000. We were happy to see that the place was occupied again and the ghosts had been rescued. At Quentin we stopped to photograph the Rio Siesta Motel sign which was one of grandma's favorites. It was being dismantled and they told us it was being taken to a, a restoration company who would fashion it back to its original look. We passed the ghost town of Foss, Oklahoma, a victim of the Depression and the dust bowl days. They had commented that buildings seem to go to ruin faster when people are gone. At Canute, a curious sighting was the old Cotton Bowl Motel. The motel was now a private home, with the signage being a faded ghost. At Elk City, we visited the Route 66 Museum, a giant the china dial stood in front. It had been made from oil drums and at once stood in front of a trading post that was owned by Wanda Quitham and her husband. Her husband was known as the Moccasin Man. He had standardized the sizing of moccasins and had organized Native Americans to produce them. We were told at the museum that John Lasseter, the film producer for the Cars movie, used Wanda as his inspiration for his character, Lizzie. The town of Eric was the last stop for us in Oklahoma. We stopped at the old curiosity shop where singer-songwriter Harley Russell was performing for a large group of Route 66 travelers. He shared that his partner Annabelle had lost her battle with cancer and was now playing in an angel band. The shop was filled with memorabilia and curiosities. Harley led us to his collection of vintage Route 66 signs and invited us to choose the one we liked the most and follow him outside. Once there, we all sang, Get Your Kicks on Route 66. We exited Oklahoma through Texola. 
a ghost town shared between Oklahoma and Texas. We were 1,000 miles from Chicago. Route 66 in search of ghosts and treasures is available through Amazon.com or at select gift shops and museums along Route 66. My book covers 2,248 miles of Route 66, traveling from Chicago to Los Angeles through all eight Route 66 states. It features 166 iconic stops. And did I cover everything? Not a chance. There's so much to see. If you plan to make the drive, consider doing it in segments because few people can be on the road as long as it would take to see it all. Thank you.